my biggest attribute was that I didn't quit. Yeah. Because it ultimately took me, you know, five, six years to really get something that worked. Ultimately, like, this company was just the first one that really worked on a consistent basis, which I was like, okay, I'm going to hold on to this for dear life. And the reason that worked out is because I didn't quit over those five, six years, and I never had a nine to five. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and today I have Marcos Ruiz, the CEO and founder of The Birdhouse. I'm really excited to have this conversation. The name may allude to what the company has, but I'll let the actual owner and creator give you all that information. Marcos, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate the invite. I'm happy we were able to make the connection. We were about to record virtually, realized we're both in Miami, Yeah. sat down and made it happen. It's usually not that easy to get my guests to come right back on the show, so I appreciate you being flexible, brother. Yeah, totally. I would rather do it in person these days, and you know everything's online, so get some personal connection and actually do it out here. Dude, getting out of the office is like one of the best things ever, working remote and being on my computer. You could give me an inkling of a reason to leave the house, and I'm taking that in a heartbeat. Yeah, I agree. I started actually taking my meetings in the morning for like 90 minutes while walking, like all my morning team meetings on Mondays this morning. Just walking for like 90 to 100 minutes. Just I start sweating by the time I get back, but it's so worth it instead of sitting out, you know, sitting at my desk the whole day. So, you think you like talk better when you're walking, like when you're outside? You think you're, you You know, I didn't think so at first, but I was talking to a client today and we were just talking about it. And I think I think better Mm -hmm. when I'm walking because I'm just everything is so like on. Yeah. So, I just start to think of things better and I remember shit and I can actually talk to my team and hit literally everything I wanted to hit. So, when I'm sitting at home and I'm just like, also have all the tabs open and everything. It's really distracting. So I'd much rather do it while I'm walking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like a, a good walk is like a superpower. I, any moment I get, I'll just leave and walk around my neighborhood. I leave my phone here and just walk around. I get my best ideas when I'm out there and then come back in and action them. So I don't know how people can just sit in a cave all day, pounding away at the keyboard. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's necessary. I feel like st- when we start, well, when I started, I was inside all day, every day, especially I was living in New York city. So I was, it was really cold for like nine months out of the year, so it's just pounding away at the cave. It was, but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, right. It ended up working out. Got yeah. you here sitting on the show. Yeah. So give everybody a little bit of a background on who you are, and then we'll go through and start taking apart the story, the journey, and yeah, the breakdown yeah. of the business. Yeah, yeah. So obviously CEO at the Birdhouse. Um, so we're a Twitter, also known as X, uh, and LinkedIn marketing agency. We scale personal brands on X through ghostwriting, content, etc. It's been quite the journey. And I want to just start with the the X part of the business. Um, that's an easy question. Do you like the new name? Do you like yeah. the old name? What, what? Um, I started like when I started the name, obviously it was for Twitter. Yeah. Uh, now the reason I didn't change because everyone was asking me, you're going to change the X house, you're going to change the name. I didn't change the name because I felt like the birdhouse now makes me look kind of OG. Yeah. That's the only reason I kept it. Um, also, I had already bought the hat. Um, but yeah, I'd like the name actually. I think the name, the problem is that people keep saying tweet and Twitter, um, and like from a marketing perspective. So anytime I put out a post, a hiring post or anything marketing related, I still say Twitter, Mm -hmm. um, slash X most of the time. Like I say Twitter for relatability and then I say X so that they don't think that I think that it's called Twitter. (laughs) You know what I mean? So I end up saying Twitter slash X. Um, but I do like the name for where it's going. Like it really is, you know, going to be the everything app. Yep. So I think it's whatever. I, it's not It's not that deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There's like those people who are like, I'm leaving the platform. I'm not on here anymore. I like the OG bird. It's like, yeah. okay, bro. I don't, you. I don't take too many things that serious. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So as like, were you a Twitter user early on? Because like for me, and I think we're a similar age, in high school, Twitter was the shit. Like yeah. You had to be on Twitter. You're beefing on Twitter. You're tweeting yeah. back at other people. Were you a user back in the day? Yeah, yeah. You could see on my profile, I made it in 2011. Oh, so, uh, so you're OG. Yeah, yeah. So I made it in, I think it was, it was either seventh or eighth grade. Um, I made my Twitter profile. And obviously, I used it back then as more as like a local forum. Yeah. You know, just what are you guys up to? Like live tweeting, like high school events and stuff like that. Um, I'd say by the time I graduated high school, which was like 2016, it became more of like a sports platform for me. Uh, news, sports, um, kind of like jokes and memes. It always was kind of that. Um, and then throughout college, it was heavily uh, on sports and soccer. I'm an Arsenal fan. Um, and then it kind of evolved into the crypto Twitter stuff in 2020, 2021, which is where I took 
kind of got my first initial following was kind of like I got a little bit of it from uh, football Twitter, also known as soccer Twitter. And then I got the rest of it from crypto Twitter. And then I switched to money Twitter when I started my business. And that's where I got majority of my following. But yeah, I've been on it for 13 years. Yeah, you've seen the majority of the <laughs> yeah. cycles on the platform and, and all the different ways people used it. And I personally love the direction it's heading. Mm -hmm. And obviously you do too, because yeah. you wouldn't be building a brand yeah. around it. Um, but it, it's cool to see how it's like really transcended into this like big town hall for people to come on. And I unlocked this money Twitter world that people like to call it two years ago. And my eyes were open to this community of people that I didn't know existed, talked and shared like a lot of really good insights. What would you say to people who, cause Twitter has gotten a bad rap since the acquisition or people have complained that it's different. What would be your response to that? Um, has Twitter changed? Has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? I think it's definitely gotten better in terms of, I mean, just looking at the underlying numbers, um, most ever active users growing at the fastest rate ever. Um, advertising now is getting better. Um, they added the ad share revenue for creators. Spaces are more active than ever. Um, you know, I started the business right when Elon really got the, I think right before, like I think it was two months before he got the acquisition. So I can't speak to how business was before. Um, but over the last two years, it's been like such an uptrend in terms of um, results for clients and growth and, and, you know, sales. So I think it's great. Obviously, I'm biased. Yeah. I also, once again, I'm not like, I'm not with these people who care that much. I mean, yeah. As long as our clients are crushing it, I'm just like, you're happy. We're good to go. It. Yeah. <laughs> and were you an Elon fan prior to the acquisition? Was it exciting news when he was buying the platform? Yeah. I was always kind of like one of those. Um, like, I definitely was an Elon fanboy before uh, he acquired it. So it was interesting to hear. Like, I thought it was going to be a joke. There was also something that had come out before that where he was going to buy Manchester United, uh, but he did it. So I didn't actually believe it, but um, I was always a fan of Tesla and SpaceX. Always was fascinated by space and was really into like uh, sustainability in college. So that's how I got kind of into the whole, the whole Tesla thing. Um, so yeah, I was definitely a fan. But so when he took over, I wasn't exactly like, this is the best day of my life. Yeah, I kind of, the way I looked at it is I had, felt like I had hit the jackpot with my business, even though I was only like three to six months old. It felt like, okay, look at the track record, pretty much undefeated when it mm -hmm. comes to business success over the long term. So I'm like, if I start my business now, I should really double down on it and kind of be the agency for, for X slash Twitter. Um, it's worked out that way. Yeah, I thought it was hilarious when everybody was like, oh, Elon's going to fail. What does yeah. he know about running a social media platform? And I was like, well... If you look at the track record, what do you know about payments? PayPal was a success. What do you know about electric vehicles? Tesla was a success. What do you know about space? SpaceX is a success. Yeah. It's like, I'm just going off the yeah. law of averages here. Yeah, it seems to be hitting at a really high batting average. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's awesome how you kind of got in before and then you were a beneficiary because whether you liked it or not, the acquisition gave Twitter a lot of free media. Like a lot of people that might have, not used Twitter since high school, might have gotten off the platform after using it early on. We're like, oh shit, Twitter's in the news, X, what is this? Let me just go check it out. Yeah. And then now we see the platform is just crushing it and continuing to get newer and newer users. Yeah, I think from a business perspective, like a lot of companies, um, just from what I've heard from clients, a lot of people were looking at it uh, when it got acquired and they were like, okay, something's going on over there. Like, I want to be on that. And I'd say even today for the past few years, like the most common thing I hear on, on sales calls with potential clients is like, yeah, I've, I've been wanting to get on Twitter. I've been wanting to get on X. I just don't know how to go about it. If people want to kind of get in on the fun. They see the growth. They know it's Elon Musk and they hear more and more people talking about it. So that people want to get in on it um, because of the kind of uh, revamp um, that's come. I think before that it was kind of going a little stale. It was just like kind of very stagnant. I mean, Twitter wasn't even in the top five. Still, still really isn't, but it's growing a lot um, in terms of total users. So I think this revamp was necessary if it wanted to really break into that Facebook, TikTok level. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting. Like you mentioned, a lot more brands want to be on the platform. I met with a publicly traded company for my day job today, and I was doing some research before our call. I went on their website. What's the number one social media they have linked on their toolbar? X. Yeah. And I'm like, 
this is a big oil and gas company. Like really? they're they're going with X as their like go to. Yeah. And I think it's a testament to a lot more brands are starting to move towards that platform as a new way to get eyeballs on their product. Yeah, it's interesting. Like there was definitely a ton of backlash the first year of a lot of brands jumping off of the platform because of the lack of censorship so a lot of brands were leaving because they were saying it's not safe for their brand Um, now i think the most recent thing that just came out maybe a few days ago was that it's become one of the most safe platforms for brands Uh, they just revamped that whole statistics so you know i expect more and more brands to start returning in terms of like advertisers and i'm talking like fortune 500 Um, obviously i work with more small businesses but Mm -hmm. I think even the Fortune 500 companies are going to slowly start trickling back in, and we've already seen it over and over again. A lot of people are even posting like X exclusives, so yeah, it's it's definitely heating up. And why do you think a lot of brands want to be on X, or even a lot of small brands like creators and individuals like that you would work with? Why do you think they want to be on X but aren't on there already? Is there a higher barrier to entry to the application because it's not just content based from like? video and 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 picture content yeah i think with a lot of like for you could just say like for example like personal brand people um it's easy it's harder to fake it when you have to write yeah so when you have to write and put out competent complete thoughts it becomes very difficult to fake it as opposed to shorts and scripts and ads and stuff like that so what you see is a lot of times these gurus and personal brands who really crush it with facebook ads they really can't make the translation to twitter because twitter is going to actually make you put out unique thoughts that people actually have to relate to in order to follow you and a lot of times these people don't really have anything unique to say yeah. uh, which is fine you know they you can make your bread through through ads um but twitter yeah it's a different beast i'd say i always tell clients that the market sophistication and awareness on twitter and linkedin are just way higher than like Facebook or an Instagram or a TikTok or anything like that. So maximum awareness, maximum sophistication, um, just the average intelligence of the average user is just so much higher than these other platforms. So it kind of weeds out the kind of low quality creators. And I think that's why less of them um, are coming on. And that's also what we do best is we can help kind of flesh out people's ideas and make them actually do well. Yeah. And before we continue to dive into what you're building at the birdhouse going back because i always like to make sure we highlight everything about your journey because there's an entrepreneur listening that might be in a certain stage and hearing that you went through that maybe is the reason they push forward the birdhouse wasn't your first ordeal wasn't your first agency wasn't your first business (laughs) talk about some of the struggles you went through to get to that product yeah, I mean, I started business when I was 19. I started like uh, day trading because when I was in the military, I was in the National Guard. I joined the National Guard when I was 19. And when I was at training, my friend had showed me uh, like Forex trading on his phone. So that was like my barrier. That was like my entry into uh, kind of internet money. Um, from there, I kind of went down the rabbit hole. I bought my first course. I bought Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I kind of went through that whole thing my first year. Um now, that's when I started my first blog when I was like 19, 20. Started my first blog, started affiliate marketing, and I kind of just went down the rabbit hole year after year. Started my first agency when I was like 21. I've tried everything. I was drop shipping. I, I've really bounced around and got a lot of shiny object syndrome, which is probably why I didn't succeed sooner. Um, but yeah, my first agency was uh, I did an Amazon pay per click agency. Then I had an IT consulting agency, which also didn't do very well. I thought that if I did IT and then mixed it with like marketing, I could do something. Nope. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, I think the big thing is that I didn't know that I had to stick to something. So like, I just kept jumping around looking for the quick money, yeah. looking to make some money in my first four weeks, first eight weeks. And it, I always ended up quitting after two months. Um, so long story short, my first real success, I did a little bit of success. Uh, I was like Facebook drop shipping, and this was three years ago right before like the whole nft thing so i did a little bit of facebook drop shipping i rolled that money into what was called nba top shot mm-hmm, yep and nba top shot was my breakout into the nft scene rolled that into like nfts i made six figures in nfts shit well no it gets worse <laughs> and i tried to roll that into like amazon automation and uh-huh. repeated the same bad habits of just jumping from thing to thing rolled that into like this amazon automation store lost like 20k 
uh, rolled that into like something else. Also lost a bunch of money. Long story short, I moved to New York City with the money and I ended up with zero. Uh, and that was like 2021 or 2022. So basically started back from zero in 2022. And I was like, okay, now what? Yeah. <laughs> so that's when I was like, okay, well, I know marketing. I know like info and I know all these things. Let me just like go on Twitter and scroll a little bit. And that's when I kind of got intro- introduced to copywriting. Um, so I started copywriting on Upwork for like 20 bucks for blogs. Uh, and then eventually I discovered who is my now co-host slash friend, JK. Um, and I saw him talking about ghostwriting. I was like, okay, ghostwriting, copywriting. It's like kind of, it seems like a hot thing. I was still kind of falling into the trap of jumping from thing to thing. I was just jumping from copywriting to ghostwriting. I was like, okay, it works out. Um, uh, long story short, I joined like this low ticket $50 a month community I basically copied his offer verbatim. It was like uh, 25K for like 10,000 followers and you basically be ghostwriting for people. I never actually closed that number. I ended up closing like a 1K a month client, a couple of 1K a month clients. One was through Upwork, one was through Twitter DMs. Um, And then eventually I closed like a 5K or sorry, 6K for like 5K followers like three times. Uh, and then from there, it just kind of kept snowballing. Elon acquired, and then I just kept iterating the offer and iterating the offer. And that's kind of like the origin story. <laughs> so, what? because, I mean, shiny object syndrome. Yeah. I mean, I don't know any entrepreneur that has not experienced that. What would be your 30 seconds of advice to the person that's listening to this right now that's probably on their fifth business? Yeah, it's sad because, like, I never learned the lesson. I just finally like the biggest thing that I my biggest attribute was that I didn't quit yeah because it ultimately took me you know five six years to really get something that worked ultimately like this company was just the first one that really worked on a consistent basis which I was like okay I'm gonna hold on for this for dear life and the reason that worked out is because I didn't quit over those five six years and I never had a nine to five um so like that's probably like my how I succeeded but my advice to my younger self was stick to the first thing because it all works right yeah you see you see a drop shipping millionaire and you see a day trading millionaire and then you see a ghost writing millionaire like you see all these people um and they all work but the problem is people don't uh stick to one so i'd say like honestly i would take a personality test figure out where my strengths are like for example on an infp my strengths are writing and arts so I would have done that, would have picked copywriting, I would have just stuck with it at like 20. <laughs> so, in like watching some of your old interviews, talking to you now, mentorship courses right. were a huge part of your success. Yeah. Sometimes courses and paid mentorships get a bad rap. Uh, what has your experience been? And what would you tell somebody who's on the other side of the camera saying, well, I'm not going to pay somebody $1,000 to lose? Yeah. This. Uh, so this is a tough one, right? Because we work with a lot of people who sell uh, courses and education and, and cohorts and mentorships and stuff like that. And I'm really passionate about the space. I don't even sell one. Um, I don't want to sell one, but I do love the space because it kind of is the reason I am here. Um, I'd say like the filter that I've developed at this point is that, I mean, for one, and for what your question was, like skepticism, skepticism's fine. But I wouldn't, as long as it doesn't like deter you from like kind of actually chasing your dream. Uh, But I think the big thing for me as like a filter is going to someone who is practicing what they preach actively. Because what I see a lot of times is people who come out with these coaching programs is they're selling a coaching program on something they're not doing anymore. And their information becomes very outdated very fast. And one thing nowadays with internet money and online businesses, the industry, every industry is changing so fast and so rapidly you actively have to be in it to truly give good information. So if you're going to buy one of these info products, I think you should be going to someone who's actively doing the thing. And then they're also doing the info business. So like, you know, if someone's, if you're going to go buy, I don't even, what's a course that you would buy? I don't know. A podcasting course, right? Uh, that person better have a fucking podcast. Yeah. It better be a good one. Right. Um, so that's, that's how I would, I would use it as a filter. Yeah. So essentially like if I'm looking to buy an e-com course, and that guy doesn't own an e-com company. Right. Anymore. Like a lot of times it's like, they oh, they did e-com to make their first 50K, but now they've done the e-com course to make their next 5 million. Yeah. And they're not. It's like a huge red flag. But, you know, not everyone has common sense, but I mean, like if someone is 
actively there are some people out there that are actually crushing i'll even shout him like robert oliver i think it is he's got this amazon brand yeah crushing it right 30 mil exit crushing it currently but that's of course i would buy if i was starting yeah right and i don't work with him by the way i'm just saying yeah uh, but you could say that for a million different courses there's tons of good ones but the problem is probably more bad ones yeah um so i think that there needs to be a course a free course on how to actually find good courses i actually thought about this was a good idea as a marketplace for for vetted courses um not something i'm gonna do that's shiny object syndrome yeah, but yeah. someone should do it yeah that's interesting like more yeah. of like a filtered down school or a filtered down wop on right you have to meet certain requirements to be on that platform not anybody and everybody well i think the real problem is that these companies like wop and school they're not exactly incentivized to do the vetting yeah, but ideally they would. It'd be cool, right? If school and WAP were able to deny. Well, they are able to, but it would be cool if they actually did yeah. deny people that were scams. Yeah, like if enough people reported scam, but then you know it's a slippery slope. So the, I think the only practical way is probably like an application system. But yeah, that, that's not the that industry's big. not there yet, right? Yeah. So that's kind of I think where the industry needs to go. I mean, you know, you have Trustpilot, but then again, it's kind of hard to do Trustpilot right away. So shit, somebody listening, go build a whole personal yeah. brand on buying every course and right. reviewing it and telling people if it's shit or not. That's actually something I've always wanted to do is like just 30, 30, 60 day challenges on these courses or just like take them. But then the problem is a lot of times these course, you know, these biz ops, they don't, they're a lot longer term than 30 days. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny you mentioned Robert Oliver. I follow him. I think I put him up there in my top five people I'm making content right now. His content is very captivating, very well done. And when you look at his stuff, you think he's crushing it. And like, I would go and buy that course. Um, but then again, there's that slippery slope for other people where they look good. And like, there's even people that I've met that I see them online and I think of them in this way. And then I meet with them and talk to them and have, have a conversation. I wouldn't buy their course or I wouldn't be part of their mentorship. Um, and and it, it is a crazy space, but for you, you've had a really positive experience with that and have had that be one of the main reasons you are in the position you are now. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I bought like, you know, shitty courses like everybody else. I think, like I said, it's about not quitting. I mean, has anyone really, like, you you have to consider yourself very lucky if your first course is just success. Mm -hmm. Like, everyone's bought a shit course that's that I know, so... I, I bought like a two thousand dollar course like two weeks ago. I haven't even opened it yet. Like, <laughs> so you know what I mean. Like, I think um, it's you have to do your due gil due diligence. I think it's kind of a rite of passage at the moment. Like everyone's bought a course that didn't work out for them, whether it was the course or it was them. Yeah. I also find that more often than not, it's on the person and not mm. the course. Like, there's a reason. You know, if if the statistic holds true that ninety percent of entrepreneurs fail then the statistic must hold true that 90% of these biz op courses will fail for you. Yep. Right. But it's no, no fault of the course. It's you. Right. So it's, that's part of the slippery slope. And then the problem being is that, you know, half of that 90% are going to look to say it was a scam or it was bullshit or leave a bad review. And then that's what gives the industry kind of a, uh, compounding bad name. Yeah. It's definitely a tough space because you're putting out a really good product, but, all of the success is dictated by the person who's actually actioning what they're learning. And that's an uncontrollable factor. You can't control people taking action. You can't tell people you can, that's that, th that quote, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And that's kind of what the course industry sits at. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I've, you know, like I said, my girlfriend runs a very successful info business. So I see the behind the scenes of her. I see the behind the scenes of the, 15 different clients we have businesses and i just know it's like the the logistics on an info business at scale are so it's just so detrimental and i say but more of a business info business not just a regular info business it's because people just fucking suck yeah <laughs> people are very the people are losers dude like it's it's so unfortunate but it's the truth like 90 percent of people are just not meant for it and the only the hard truth is that the only way for them to find out that they're not cut out for it is to go through the pain paying fucking 4k and realizing i'm not cut out for this yeah i'm just not good enough yeah. or i just don't have what it takes yeah it's tough it's a tough scene it's i don't know i don't know the way forward i'm leave that one to like school or something or wop but i'm just gonna be out here promoting the good guys yeah <laughs> for sure so 
at what point did you start to think there was a real market for the birdhouse? There was a real need for what you offer. Yeah, I'd say like um, I started my business in May or maybe August, something like that of 2022. Um, I'd say after three to four months, I quickly realized um, that there's definitely a market for growth, but there's a problem in that people aren't patient enough. And I wasn't big enough to target companies who are, you know, allocating millions of dollars a year in, in funding to pay for my service. So what I quickly realized is that, you know, if you're targeting personal brands, the problem with targeting personal brands, uh, which is who I'm targeting, is that personal brands typically don't have a marketing budget mm -hmm. unless they're the big dogs who are mostly going in-house and not agency. Yeah. So for me to justify a personal brand to afford me, because companies allocate hundreds of thousands in marketing, very easy, especially you know if you're doing e-commerce marketing. But for me, personal brands, I was like, okay, these guys can't afford me for the most part. Um, and if they do, it's very short LTV because they're churning after they get their first 5k followers or they're churning even after 10k followers. And you could knock it out of the park for them and hit your guarantee and do all this stuff, but they still didn't make a lot of money. So they're not going to renew with you after you deliver on that initial agreement. Yeah. So I had my first client who was a 3k a month retainer and he was, this wasn't my first client, but my first 3k client and he was an info business. Um, he had like maybe like 18k followers at the time and he just needed someone to write for him. And I was like, okay, I'll write for you. We helped him crush it and go viral. But what was actually interesting is not only did they go viral and crush it, these people really wanted to track the performance of the sales team on Twitter. So I was like, okay, this is new for me. I'm going to learn a lot about sales. Um, and that's when I kind of was introduced into the whole sales rep, kind of sales team closers, all this stuff. Um, and I quickly realized that they are going to make a lot of money off my service for 3K. Mm -hmm. And they ended up doing, um, one month was like 93K, another month was like 137K. Holy and, shit. And this is cash collected. Um, and 3K so, spent was pretty good. Right, right. So like, you know, we were, they were freaking out on the channel and they were sending like all caps and they were saying like, oh my God, 56X ROAS, like all this stuff. I was like, okay, now I need to figure out how to actually, ca I didn't think this at the time, I, I know now. But I, what I was actually thinking at the time is like, how do I capture more value from this? Um, so a couple clients later, I, you know, they gave me some referrals because they were really, um, really happy with us. And I started only targeting personal brands who were going to sell info products. So I was like, okay, if we can crush it for them, we can crush it for others. And that's what we did. And we got our first performance deal uh, after that percentage deal. Um, now we're actually capturing more value uh, of the sales. And after that, I was like, okay, this is my new niche. My niche found me. Yeah. And then I just kind of went all in with that. That's when I knew I had something. Is when they said, when they were making six figures in a month from, you know, me writing tweets, I was like, okay, we got something here. And something, yeah. something's right. Yeah. So you get those clients, you start to realize there's a market. What does it look like for you on your end from a business perspective? Like, are you writing a tweet a day, a thread a week? Like, what does that look like? Or is it all tailored to the client? Yeah, at the time, um, I was writing. At the time, I was writing two tweets a day, one of which was a thread a day. So we were doing seven threads, a thread every day. Wow! And we were doing also a tweet a day. So it was fourteen posts a week. Yeah, it was seven, seven, seven a week. And we were also doing something called an auto DM giveaway, which is basically like a lead magnet. Um, so we were doing that. And after I got to like four or five clients, it was pretty much just like wake up. Drink. A, I would brew. I remember I got a, had a Smeg coffee pot mm -hmm. that some. I think I think Julia bought it for me. It was a full coffee pot of black coffee. I would drink the entire pot of coffee. I would write tweets. My I'd write my personal tweets for my personal brand because my personal brand was taking off at this point. Uh, and then I would write all my clients' tweets. I had like four or five clients at the time, and I'd write from six to twelve. At twelve, I would go to the gym. At one, I would eat, and then. From like one thirty or 2 to the end of the night, I would take sales calls or client calls, whatever the mixture was. And I just did that every day for like six months until I started hiring employees. <laughs> so nowadays, I'm, you know, play much more of a CEO role, yeah. um, which is, it's much more call intensive now. Um, but that was my routine probably for the first six to eight months before I started bringing on my executive assistant and then my first writer. And just to to frame it for the person watching now who maybe is like, 
oh shit, I, I want to build a personal brand on X. Let me reach out to Marcos and like yeah. get get some information. Me, if I went to you right now and said, dude, I'm building this podcast. We're 54, 55 weeks in. Mm. I want to start building a personal brand on X. Mm. What would some of the requirements that I would need for you to think that it would be successful and worth your time? To work with us or to build a personal brand in general? No, like to work with you because I want to frame it for somebody that might yeah. be like, well, I want to use you all. Well, to work with us, um, we take – the one side of it would be kind of the personal brand who wants to sell some 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 sort of info product or product in general. That's one side of it. And then the other person is the kind of high-level eight, nine-figure net worth personal brand who just wants to have a voice. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are really the two – qualities i'd say when we're talking about someone who's selling an info product it needs to be someone who actively like i I mentioned before someone who as actively has that business rolling and then they also have the info product on the side and they want to build their personal brand and use the info product as kind of like a front it's like a liquidating funnel so the info product is good but they have a real business too you know what i mean so like that's kind of the person we're attracting um and the other side of it is if you have any eight nine figure entrepreneur listeners or business owners, scientists, doctors, anyone like that who wants to build their personal brand, we'd love to have them too. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully we could shake the tree and and find a few of those (laughs) hanging up at the top. Um, So you mentioned LinkedIn as well. You're doing it on LinkedIn, very similar platform, but people kind of look at it as a more business, Mm -hmm. more formal Mm -hmm. platform. When did you all start to do LinkedIn? We started, so we added LinkedIn to our, our service stack in 2024 then just three or four months ago <clears throat> and the reason being was one it was just highly requested clients were asking for it and i was like okay i'm going to be referring these people anyways might as well just take the money um then what i realized is um it's not that hard to get results we're already writing the content we just kind of have to repurpose it so also i heard heard what really pushed me over the, the edge was re- two reasons one my friend Lara uh, Acosta, she's like a LinkedIn guru. Mm-hmm. She was pushing it a lot. Um, and then also Gary Vee was pushing it a lot. So all the voices getting in my head, clients are, I'm referring clients to other ghostwriters. I'm like, okay, let's just, let's just add this service. So that was the reasoning behind it. Um, but in general, like kind of the bull case for LinkedIn is that it's becoming more of a content platform and mm-hmm. less of a job board now. Yep. Video, hashtags, you know, long form posts networking like there's a lot going on over there it's definitely the more b2b centric po- uh, platform but for who most of our clients are targeting it still works out like i'm not exactly working with people targeting like 18 year old 19 year old rolex kids like yeah we're not, that's not really who we really work with for the most part so linkedin was a good opportunity and are you bullish on linkedin going forward i mean obviously it's part of your brand but yeah. is it i guess i don't want to ask that question i want to ask more of like my tweet or my content on Twitter, how different is it when I go to LinkedIn or is it just something that's yeah. a simple repurpose? It depends on the person. Um, if you're just going to be talking about podcasting, you, it's a simple repurpose. I'd say Twitter, you have more of the kind of unlimited tweets limit where you could just kind of shower thoughts, say what's on your mind, conversational, whereas LinkedIn is more broadcast, mm-hmm. put out structured posts. Um, I'd say the way we like to look at it is the structured posts that are going to go on X can go also on LinkedIn. Um, I wouldn't put, you know, half of the tweets I put out on, on X on LinkedIn, but anything that's structured client results, testimonials, educational posts, stuff like that, even stories, I'll put those on LinkedIn. Got it. We talked before we started rolling that you just went to a acquisition.com event Mm -hmm. with Alex Hormozzi. Alex Hormozzi has a really awesome, and luckily he's got a massive audience, so this works for him, but he mentions that he doesn't have a notebook. He just tweets all of his thoughts mm-hmm. and ideas out, right. and then at the end of the week, we'll audit which one's got the most engagement, and then just make content on yeah. that. What are your thoughts on that strategy? I tried it myself for a while after he said that, and I found myself just not tweeting enough. Like I felt like I wasn't getting enough volume out to get the growth that I, that I desired. Um, so I think it's a good strategy if you can build the muscle. Yeah. Um, it's also a great strategy if you already have an audience because you kind of get the growth as a byproduct Mm -hmm. and you have 500,000 followers. If you're at zero followers and you try to just brain dump stuff, you're going to get zero followers. So, (laughs) so there's much, there's just much more to it. Um, but I did try it. 
I also realized that I don't really like doing structured videos, so there's no point of doing that. I, yeah. I had nothing to validate. So I think it's really good for certain people. Um, I also like the way he does it. It, it almost sounds like he's scheduling his posts because they seem too good. But um, yeah, I think it's cool. I think it's good for most people. Yeah, right. Do you think he's actually sitting there just punching away? In, I don't know. Moment, I should have. Like, I should have checked. The, I should have checked the feed while he was giving his talk at the. Yeah, thing. right. Yeah. Posts are going live. Yeah. It's like, yo, you're not. Yeah. You're not. You're not, you're not posting those. Yeah. yeah, it's like middle of the podcast. You hit timeout. You got to go tweet an idea yeah. that just came up. <laughs> um. So you're you're kind, now you've built this business. You're an authority in the space. You mentioned in another podcast, like it's kind of just the game of outlasting people. Like when you see the other agencies fall off and give up. It's actually good news for you because it validates that you're 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 successful. There is customers, and now they failed. There's more people coming in. What what kind of hurdles do you see coming forward? Like, do you think anything? Do you see any like hurdles that the business is going to have to jump through? Yeah, I'd say like in terms of speed of scale, um, it's we're a little bit at the mercy of the platform, like you know. X advertising is definitely going to be a serious avenue for us one day, but you know, we are at the mercy of X to create a good advertising platform. Yeah. So we can't really control that. So I'd say a lot of stuff is out of our control. We don't know what features are coming out. Elon's volatility is a bit of a platform risk. Um, so there's a lot of risk involved and we're at the mercy of, of, of a lot of things. Um, so that's probably our biggest hurdle, but as long as we kind of play to our strengths, I don't foresee us having any, uh, problems growing at a steady rate. You now, like you mentioned, have taken more of a CEO role. You've hired people, you've created a team. What advice could you give to a CEO listening or someone who wants to be a CEO from the experiences you gain going from the individual contributor to the overseer? Yeah, I consider myself a pretty unorthodox CEO. Um, I'm like very, I'm very laid back, I'm very meeting light. Um, but I've always told my team, you know, as long as things are done correctly and they're done on time and they're done well, I don't really care when you work. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've kind of created a culture of, you know, a little bit of autonomy, decentralization, almost in the spirit of X. Um, so that was kind of the goal. It's very Web3 X-ish with the way I run the company. Um, I also don't really like talk down to people. Yeah. I, I The way I've hired people, they, they're basically entrepreneurs who just don't want to run their own business that's you know what i mean like yep. um so i have a really good relationship with them i'm also i know i'm young and my whole team is within three to five years of me like nobody's you know what i mean they're all younger um but we're all if not the same a little, they're a little bit younger so i treat it very much like a collective um and yeah i'm very chill manager i mean i have that i definitely have a little bit of that military stern about me if i if i need it mm -hmm. but i don't really need it that often i feel like i just i hired the best like we have the best team in the world so yeah i don't have any advice good luck, good luck. <laughs> yeah. good luck you're not gonna build a better team than we did so um i just kind of treat it always like a we not me yeah. we not i that's if you ever see me i, I never really try to say i or take credit for things because we just have like an amazing team yeah and and i mean that's advice right there like whether you like it or not you created a good culture and that has in turn built you the best team, whether you're a hiring guru or yeah. a mind reader and can find it. That's 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 between yeah. you and yourself. But yeah. like culture is extremely important. And I've seen a lot of businesses go to shit because they don't pay attention to culture. They don't foster a good culture internally. So you just mentioning that and saying it's a, a, a like right when I ask you, what what's a highlight culture? We have a great culture like that shows that that's a key part of the business. Yeah, that is in my opinion, the most important part of hiring and creating people yeah. or a team. Yeah. Well, you know, we're trying to build something that's going to last a whole lot longer than two years. So, yeah. Um, you know, I try to do it slow but right. Something off the business topic and that you've mentioned in your past that you're not a designer guy. You don't need the Gucci, the Louis, <laughs> the Rolexes. You like to spend your money on travel and experiences. Yeah. What are... What are, what are, what is your best travel experience ever? Oh, that's tough. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd say up there's some like I I tend to cherish like a lot of the little things in different countries. Like 
for example, one of my favorite memories is going to like a mom and pop shop in Bangkok and it was just like little Thai food and it was a Thai couple and it was just like just us in the restaurant. You know what I mean? That's sick. I find that to be an amazing experience that I'll never forget. <clears throat> it's called <clears throat> Tum Tum Thai. <laughs> so that place was great. Um, definitely Chiang Mai with the, ele- we went to an elephant sanctuary. That was amazing. Can't really beat that. Um, yes. I mean, there's so many. I loved Singapore. My first time there felt so like in the future. Yeah. Is it like a futuristic world? Yeah. It felt like, you know, that scene from Doc, did you watch Marvel? Yeah. That scene from Multiverse of Madness, Doctor Strange, when they landed that really futuristic society, uh, world where the uh, where the Illuminati is, huh. and it's just like all green and like that's what Singapore felt like. It felt like felt like there was like a Fantastic Four Stark Tower everywhere. Like it was sick. What an amazing country. <laughs> that's badass. Yeah. Is it true? <clears throat> Maybe you don't know. Is it true that you could get fined for spitting on the ground over there? Is it like I hope I hope not. I don't know. I- yeah, you might. I don't know. <laughs> you might have outstanding a worn out for your. Yeah, rest in Singapore. I don't. I don't know. I, I didn't. I don't know. It felt pretty chill when I was there. Oh, to be okay. honest, I don't think I saw a single cop. Oh. And I went to Singapore three times. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Hey, fun fact: don't believe everything you read on the internet. Yeah, it's never. I don't know. I don't overthink things. So. Yeah, you seem like a very just go with the flow type of person. Just whatever happens, kind of happens. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah, I am. You know, try to live in the moment. <clears throat> Tomorrow's not promised kind of guy. It sounds corny, but yeah, I've always been pretty laid back with most things. And where where does that come from, you think? Um, I have no idea, to be honest. Um, have you always been like that? Yeah, I've definitely always been like that. Um, I, I don't know. I've My parents are, I think my, my mom's like that a lot. My mom's very like, both of my parents are like, eh, it's not that deep, like. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we're like a not it's an it's not that deep kind of family. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I like to ask this question to to everybody that sits in that chair that has a business. If you were to look back in ten years on the birdhouse, what needs to happen in that period for you to deem it a success? I think we'd have to continue growing. Because I do believe in like business principle that if you're not growing, you're dying. So I think consistent growth for 10 years would be amazing. You know, I don't know how easy that is. Yeah. Barely been alive 10 years. (laughs) It's, you know, I think consistent growth is from a business perspective is is number one. And then number two would be maintaining the same culture, regardless of size, regardless of if we have an office or not. Um, I think maintaining the same culture and the same values regardless of size and scale is probably like the two big things and then consistent growth. Cause you know, we actually have to survive to make it 10 years. Yeah. So. Right. And I, and I always ask that question because 10 years for a business is, is a success in its own. Right. Like most businesses don't make it past three years. I think it is, or two and a half years. So I always like to ask that because everybody has a different version of success and just making it to that as a success, but that's an easy cop out answer. So right. I appreciate you explaining like culture again is really important. And if you can grow consistently for 10 years, hopefully I have you on the show multiple times yeah. in that period as you continue to break yeah. eight figure, nine figure, yeah. 10 figure business. Maybe I'll be at Gary V level in 10 years and you, Dude. I'll come straight. I'll come right back on as well. Yeah, I, I got in early. If you make it to the Gary V level, I got in early. You bought me. I'm, I'm a shit coin right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just bought yeah. the Marcos Ruiz shit coin and I am hoping that it goes yeah. to the moon. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, yeah. Just going through your story here, it's, it's, it's been an awesome conversation to kind of walk through because I have some entrepreneurs that come here and it's very like straightforward, serious. Like, this is what I did. This is how much money I made. This is how I'm doing it. And like, this has been such a laid back conversation as we just kind of casually walk through your journey, how you built this company, what you've gone through. If you had to leave the people listening here who have hopefully made it this far with us, with a piece of advice doesn't even have to be business related or maybe a quote that you love that has like motivated you or changed your life. What would that be? It's a good one. I think from a quote, I always had a favorite quote. It's by James Cameron. Um, I think he's the director of avatar. Yeah, he is. He is. Okay. Um, it's if you aim ridiculously high and fail, you'll still fail above everyone else's success. 
So I've always tried to aim ridiculously high, and then if I fail, I fail, you know what I mean? So what is the ridiculously high aim for the birdhouse? I want to compete with uh, VaynerMedia and Ogilvy and all these other top, top, top companies. Okay. Do it our way and not try to fall into their traps. All right. You're, and that, you're not making a shitload of short form content. Yeah, no, it's not, there's no traps. I mean, it's more so just I don't want to like ever be too corporate. You know what I mean? 100%. I want it to be more like a collect, collective and lean into the future and emerging tech and Web3 and decentralization and kind of still compete with the top with Vayner and all these other people. For sure. And we, we didn't really touch on it, but do you have a passion for crypto web three? Like it seems. Yeah. Like- yeah. I definitely, I mean, I, I, I was always a gamer. Okay. Um, I've been a gamer my whole life to this day. Nice. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about us playing Warzone. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I'll probably play some FIFA later to let off some steam, but I've, I've always been a gamer. Um, and I think the whole NFT web three thing just really resonates with me. Yep. Um, just from like an ownership perspective, like leaderboards and and skins and all that was great that's like a great start but i think from a tech perspective it goes so much deeper with with ownership and with with decentralization and bitcoin and governance um i think it's awesome i think it's going to be great for like having trustless systems with smart contracts and even as an agency like if i can have a contract where if i hit a certain amount of revenue tracked on the blockchain then it releases a certain amount of money tracked on the blockchain and everything's just can just be so automated i think we're quite a ways away from that but it's part of the reason of surviving is that we can actually go and embrace that technology and i definitely love the vr and ar stuff so there's just so much to be excited about so we're kind of building what's here now so that we can be around for what's there later for sure and i mean oh just by when you mentioned you graduated high school we're one year apart and we're pretty damn lucky to be growing up in our 20s in this period. Yeah. There's plenty of people who would say you're unlucky because of unaffordability and housing, all the shit going on. But at the same time, we're at this huge inflection point with technology. And I had the, in, in college, one of the few things I actually attended <laughs> was a talk with the CEO of Pepsi for their uh, Europe division. And he showed this chart of innovation in their company. And Pepsi has been around for as long as companies have been publicly traded. I'm pretty sure it was one of those early companies. And he showed this innovation chart and it was just going slowly. It's like 1960, 70, 80, 90. And you start to see it hockey stick. And from there till right now, we're still in a hockey stick. It stopped. And he looked at all of us and he's like, I'm the CEO of Pepsi Europe one of the biggest companies in the world. I do not know when the hockey stick will stop. And nobody around me knows when the hockey stick will stop because once you got the technology ball rolling, people continue to innovate, people get smarter, people get more technology. So I think we're really blessed to be growing up in this amazing time here where technology has basically just blown a crater through the barrier to entry into a lot of industries and I think entrepreneurship and the amount of entrepreneurs we've seen have been a beneficiary of that. Yeah. I think Jeff Bezos put it best where it's like he and us are, we're able to benefit off the infrastructure that people built who we don't even know exists, like who invented the internet, right? Like they built the infrastructure yeah. for us to go be people to go make courses and make a million dollars in a day yeah. and like do drop shipping and like all this stuff and, you know, millionaires popping up everywhere, right? In the future with, with web three and with, um, and with space and all these things like, you know, Jeff Bezos is building space infrastructure for the future going to be like space millionaires in 40 years. And they're just going to be popping up like crazy. And same thing with web three, they already are. So somebody builds the infrastructure and we're able to take advantage of it. Hey, I hope I'm a space millionaire. And yeah, me too. Billionaire. <laughs> me Hopefully too. we're up there having a great time. <laughs> well, this has been an amazing conversation. I want to make sure that the people listening can go and follow you, connect with you. Mm. All of your stuff will be linked below, but what's the best place for them to reach out to you? Yeah, it's Marcos Ruiz on all platforms, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. That's ITS, and then my name, Marcos Ruiz. So X, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube. I'm the same on everything, so that's the best place to reach out. Amazing. Well, thank you again for sharing all this information, making the trip over here to have this conversation with me. I'm excited about your future going forward. Hopefully continue to break milestones and I'll continue to keep having you on to share those experiences. But again, just appreciate you making the time for this. Yeah, let's do it again one year from today. One year from today. (laughs) Hey, 
Note it. One year from today. See if we're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> one year from today, we'll redo this conversation. And hopefully both of us are sitting here with a lot of growth and amazing stories to talk about. Oh, yeah. Thank Cheers. you so much, brother. Of course.